Dorine van Noren has been a diplomat for more than 20 years. In this lecture, she will tell us about one of the most important philosophies in Africa, Ubuntu. Instead of focusing on the individual, Ubuntu focuses on brotherhood and community. Please welcome to the stage Dorine van Noren. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak uh, like this. Um, I'll first introduce myself. I uh, worked for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for 20 years. I was posted in uh, Sri Lanka and in Turkey. I've also worked on the Southern Africa desk and I've worked on the North America desk and I've worked in the Advisory Council for International Relations. Now you will of course ask yourself why does a person who is a diplomat stand here in Thinking uh, Planet and speak about philosophy and where is the origin of her interest in Ubuntu? Because that is not a conventional topic for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Well currently I'm working at the Ministry of Education as a liaison for UNESCO. But my uh, story with Ubuntu started much earlier. And before I go into the bigger philosophy of Ubuntu, I just want to give you a little bit of personal background. Yes. No. Does anybody recognize the girl in this chair? Right? Uh, does anybody recognize the chair? Does anybody want to guess where this chair is standing? No one? Yes, in South Africa, and what is the occasion? <laughs> okay, I won't keep you in suspense. This was the chair of Nelson Mandela. How the hell did I end up in the chair of Nelson Mandela? These are uh, pictures from my private photo album, so they're still a little bit blurred because it's just before the digital age. And um, in this picture, you see the Mandela coming out of his um, car and he's just going to deliver his uh, speech, uh, uh, which basically uh, marked the ending of uh, apartheid. And under, in the, under uh, the below picture, you see Mandela delivering his speech. I have to look here, sorry. This is the hall where Mandela uh, delivered his speech and the setting of it. And here are some of the people who were present. You can see Alan Boussac, um, Yasser Arafat with uh, Fidel Castro, uh, Boutelesi, and also you see walking by the head of uh, Winnie Mandela. Now this is a setting where I had to perform because I was an exchange student in South Africa in 1994 and I joined the UCT Choir for Africa. And the UCT Choir for Africa was the University of Cape Town. The Choir for Africa had just won the national competition. And that meant that we were personally invited to come and sing for Mandela himself. So what a great honor for me as a white exchange student being part of a black choir uh, to have to perform for Mandela himself. So I stand here today because I believe that whatever you witness in your life, you have to also pay it forward. So now we are 20 years later and I'm going to pay it forward. Those lessons that I learned in Africa led me to do a study when I was working for the International Advisory Council on what the relevance of Ubuntu could be for our uh, sustainable development goals. And the sustainable development goals are goals that have been approved by the United Nations in 2015. Uh, for the coming 15 years until 2030. And when I was doing a study for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I said to my colleagues, but if we want to talk about sustainable development in also countries of the South, we also need to talk about their life vision and their cosmovision. And that startled a lot of people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, said, how so and why is that relevant? So that is, was the basis for my research. And I'm very happy to stand here for you today because the previous speakers also spoke about Buddhism and they spoke about Buen Vivir. And what I did in my research is actually combining Buen Vivir, Buddhism and Ubuntu, uh, looking at the parallels and looking at the relevance uh, for our society today. Now, I find this a beautiful picture which is taken from the Culture and Development Dialogue Report of the United Nations, which was part of uh, formulating the development goals. And you see people sitting in a, a circle and the slogan for Ubuntu or the proverb in African languages, 
uh, that is as associated with Ubuntu is I am because we are. So I am here because you are here in this audience. And uh, I am not a single atom, but I am part of all the people that are here today. Now this is the, the proverb from which Ubuntu is derived or commonly in, in people's mind. And that is called Umuntu Nugamuntu Nagabantu. And the word Muntu means the word person and the word Bantu means per, uh, the, the word humanity. So it is uh, translated as a person is a person through other persons. Now, I took a long time to draw this picture because I'm first going with you into the abstract of what the word Ubuntu means because Ubuntu philosophy wasn't written down and therefore some people say Africans didn't have a philosophy because they didn't have a written tradition other than, for example, Islamic tradition. Now, there are many African philosophers who say that is not true because there was an oral tradition and you can find the philosophy of the people back in the grammar of the language. So the word Ubuntu exists only of two syllables, but that two syllables basically signify the whole universe. The word Ubu is what I have made the black circle, is um, the word for everything that is lying abstract or dormant, that has not come to life yet. And the word Natu is the life force, and the life force brings all the abstract patterns of Ubu to life. So I have uh, put the life force in the middle. Now you see um, I made circles within the black circle, which are different um, words. For example, the word kintu, the green circle, is the word for nature. But that also exists of two syllables, the word ki and the word natu. So you recognize again the word natu is life force, and ki is the abstract of nature that comes to life through the life force. So the same counts for the word kuntu, which is the quality of a being, or the the word hantu, which is space and time, and most importantly also for the word bantu, which is ba and nutu. But you can see in the lower three circles that the word bantu doesn't only mean our human community of now, our presence here today, but it is also the people who came before us, or what the Africans call the living dead, because the dead people are not really dead, they are living dead, or they are ancestors. And the human community also consists of people who are still going to come, so the unborn or what we call the future generations. Um, the African philosopher Ramos actually said it very nicely, but in a mystic way, he said Ubuntu actually means Ubu, namely the enfolded being before it manifests, so the abstract being, which is in motion towards temporarily having become, which means that the life force means brings the abstract pattern to life, which is comparable to um, the circle, which you also see, for example, in Hinduism, when they talk about Brahma, Shivu, Shi, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. You can also derive African philosophy from African proverbs. So I'm going to read a few for you. The source and justification of all power is in the people. This is a concept of democracy. We may go our own way whenever urgent and vital issues arrive, we still have the obligation to come together and try and find a common solution. You find here the, the very cardinal idea of consensus politics. And when I was part of the UCT Choir of, for Africa, I really understood what it meant to have consensus politics because we had two, two hours of choir practice and then we would have three hours of meeting afterwards about the planning of the choir practice. So that meant for me, on average, three, rep three rehearsals a week is three times two hours choir practice and another 15 hours of meetings because we would never uh, leave one another without um, all agreeing on the course of action. It also relates to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which you all know uh, was there at the end of apartheid, which had as a, a cardinal point that you have to come to forgiveness and there is a confrontation between the victim and the perpetrator of the crime and when truth has been spoken there is forgiveness and the person is going to be reintegrated in the community. Now there are also economic principles of uh, Ubuntu and there is a proverb about that. It says, if faced with the choice between wealth and the preservation of life of another human being, being one should choose the life of the other. Now this means that sharing goes above wealth. So it's a different economic principle from our economy where we 
accumulate wealth and we find it very normal that one person accumulates more wealth than the other person. It also refers to a very important um, principle of African philosophy, which is called mutual aid. So mutual aid refers to reciprocity, which you also find, for example, in what the previous speaker was speaking about in uh, Buen Vivir. Now, it also says something about the integrity of the whole community, namely that no single human being can thoroughly or completely be useless. So any person, whether that person has committed a crime, whether that person has a handicap, or whether that person is ill, it's an integral part of the community. It's not a burden to the community because every person comes in life with its own mission. Uh, you can see there's also a metaphysical uh, dimension to Ubuntu. And uh, there's a proverb who says, if God dishes you a rice in, in a basket, do not wish to eat soup. Namely, accept your faith. If you get rice, don't ask for soup. And because of the metaphysical dimension, I included this one. No one shows a child the supreme being, which means to the African mind, from the perspective of Ubuntu, spirituality is self-evident. I'm just checking the time. Uh, I would have normally shown you a movie, but we have very little time. So I want to just tell you, if you would like to see a movie, you can find it on Global Oneness Project, which has beautiful choir music in it as well. And um, it summarizes basically the, the views of different African people in South Africa about Ubuntu, uh, which I have summarized in two words, namely it's a collective vision of life and it is very much about compassion. Now, it is also a living philosophy, so it's not only an abstract philosophy in, in sayings or in grammar, but you can also ask any person on the street, what do you think uh, Ubuntu is, and you will get an answer from the heart. And I must say that when I lived in South Africa myself, that is what touched me the most. The, the day that I asked somebody, but what is this Ubuntu, they formed a circle around me, and each and every person said from their own heart what they thought that Ubuntu meant. And sometimes I wonder whether we in the West, if you ask any person here in the audience or on the street, what do you think about human rights, whether we would also be able to give a, an answer from our heart. So I'm going to read you a few quotes of the people that I interviewed. It starts in the communities. I am where I am today because of the other people at home. You should not forget where you come from. They uplifted you and you uplift them so that you can contribute back. You give back to the others. You are expected to share with your neighbors. If you are raised with those values, you do not think what the effect of it is going to be on your own intake when you give something. It just happens. Now, this may sound very idealistic. And this person also said, well, in our modern South Africa, we have, of course, many problems. So there are, are changing values. And she says the following. Now people are moving away from that, from Ubuntu. People are adopting Western ways of doing things. My own kids ask me, why did all of this stop? And I don't have the answer. As we develop and climb up the ladder of social development, we are becoming very single-minded. This is a worry across the board. We subconsciously know that what is happening is wrong. We should talk as humans as people, as humanity. Even if we are not friends, we can interact at a humanitarian level, treat one another with respect, acknowledge to me that I am and I acknowledge to you that you are. Now we live in silos. Treat one another with, with my family, my interest. That is not what we are. We should not forget who we are, what makes us unique. Ubuntu is the pulse of everything the pulse of life. And what I found so beautiful about this quote is that she is an ordinary person, but she calls Ubuntu the pulse of life. And then we go back to the first picture that I showed you, where I gave you this very abstract um, concept of the universe, but this person also refers to Ubuntu as the pulse of life. So it's not just I share with my neighbors, but there's a whole philosophy that people have really incorporated. Now, I'm, I'm speaking at Thinking Planet, so I in included for you also a slide about the environment. Because Ubuntu, by most South Africans that I met, and that's many people living in the townships who do not live at their original lands anymore, it means ma mainly how you treat the other person, and that I am because of the other person. But there is also an environmental dimension through to Ubuntu that a lot of people, even in South Africa, have forgotten. They 
they link the environment more to the future generations and because the future generations are part of the Bantu community as I explained they say therefore we also need to look for the after the environment but there is a much more direct relationship between Ubuntu and the environment and um, Mogoba Ramosa one of the African philosophers says the following to care for another implies caring for the physical nature as well Without such care, the interdependence between human beings and physical nature would be undermined. And this is called the concept of Siriti. And the concept of Siriti means that African people believe that there is a field and that field connects all living beings. So it is about what the, the Zen, um, the Zen uh, Buddhist uh, speaker spoke about before the... I don't know how to translate it in English. The, he, he, he spoke about the net of pearls where every person is only an intersection of interaction and basically you find that also in African philosophy um, where if you affect nature basically they say you, you are also affecting every everything else that is connected to nature and that is also yourself and this you can find back in the Bill of Rights um, of the South African Constitution and there it says in section 24 the right to an environment that is not harmful to the health and well-being and to have the environment protected for the benefit of present and future generations. So here you see again that the Bantu concept is incorporated in the constitution and at the time that the constitution was written that was a very ad advanced concept uh, to have the future generation part of the constitution. The word Ubuntu does not feature in the South African constitution but it does feature in the draft constitution and unfortunately it's, it has been left out in the final constitution because it was mainly there to enable the truth and reconciliation commission to operate and I must say that afterwards judges brought it back into legal culture by having a lot of jurisprudence of the constitutional court in which they refer to Ubuntu and the meaning of Ubuntu in everyday life and we don't have time to go into that but we can do another lecture on that another time but what is very interesting is that you see here a picture of a um, demonstration against a mining project. It's the Kolobeni uh, mining project in South Africa. And uh, the traditional leader spoke up in the name of Ubuntu about the mining project. And they say something very interesting. They talk about the Bill of Rights and then they say the mandate of the Bill of Rights does not simply arise from the Bill of Rights only. It is a duty that is implicit in our sense of accountability to our ancestors who are identified with the earth. So the Bantu community is also the ancestors and the ancestors are in the earth, or at least linked to the earth. The strong attachment to the land which traditional communities have is a source of indigenous knowledge and properly understood it is a progressive, inclusive cosmology. So inclusive means everybody and every living thing is part of it. As the planet is increasingly compromised by a development logic that places life at the service of the economy, traditional leaders and customary law work from the inverse assumption. The economy must be at the service of life. Now here you see a uh, Sangoma, which is a traditional leader. And uh, there's a beautiful movie about him too, which I really recommend you look at. Uh, Global Oneness Project, where he is speaking about the, the mother mind and the warrior mind. And the mother mind is basically what he calls, or what I would call, thinking with the heart. And the warrior mind is the masculine mind, which is more analytical thinking. Now, I have summed up the few uh, merits of uh, Ubuntu, because some people criticize Ubuntu as irrelevant for today. And uh, this is a little bit scientific, so I'm not going to go very deeply into it, but it's a con collective ontology, and ontology means uh, a way of being or a way of looking at being. So the way we look at being in the West is more individual, and the way of uh, looking at being in Africa is more of a coll collective ontology. So it goes beyond what we understand as individual well-being and individual human rights. It's also going beyond what we call the capability theory. And the capability theory was formulated by Amartya Sen, and he has won the Nobel Prize for Economics by reformulating the purpose of economy as not being the growth of the gross national product, but um, uh, five freedoms that he has formula formulated. So he says, for us to have um, a proper life, we need to actualize our freedoms. But in his theory, to my opinion, he is still... Um, reasoning from an individual point of view. Whereas if you take everything as a collective, you may come to different conclusions. Or 
you may not deny what Amartya Sen has said, but you may want to elaborate on that. Now, in economic theory, we also speak about rational homo economicus, making rational decisions in the marketplace on cost-benefit an analysis. You can also question that from the perspective of social personhood, because if you um, if you depart from the assumption that you come into life through your mother, which is already not your own doing, and you come into life through the meeting of your mother and your father, and you come and you are born in a culture from the very first second that you are born, then you cannot say that you are an individual which is disconnected from the rest of life or from the rest of the people. So who are you and what is your identity if you disconnect yourself from the others, if it's not possible to disconnect yourself from the others? So it was very nice in the Zen lecture, the person came with the last uh, sentence was, uh, the master said, uh, he was asked, who am I? And his answer was, I don't know who I am. So Ubuntu is also a collective responsibility that correlates to global public goods. Uh, global public goods have been defined in science as those things that we need to collectively are organize. And they have uh, defined that in a very narrow way, saying anything that you cannot possibly exclude somebody from and um, that my use is not going to go at the cost of your use, those things you cannot say that we can do individually. For example, the oxygen in the air, if I breathe the oxygen, it doesn't go at your cost, and I can also not exclude you from that. But you may, of course, ask if we want to have such a technical dis the, the definition of what we want to do collectively. You may also want to say what we want to do collectively is a normative decision. So. What is it that I may not exclude you from instead of what is it that I cannot exclude you from? Because maybe in future I can exclude you from oxygen. Would that be fair? So that goes very closely to Ubuntu, which departs from the collective point of view. Now, I cannot go into this, but if you want to reason from an Ubuntu point of view, you may come to a different law system or a different economic system since the law is is the basis of our economic system and our philosophical and ethical way of thinking is the basis of law. Now, there's a lot of criticism from the West about Ubuntu. So I've been through a lot of academic articles, which I did not know that existed because I learned Ubuntu in the field when I studied in the University of Cape Town. But uh, to my big surprise, when I started my study and I thought, where am I going to start? I found out between 1994 and now there has been a lot of articles written by African philosophers on Ubuntu. But there has also been a lot of criticism. First of all, people say Ubuntu is not a universal value. Secondly, people say, you see this nice little hut, it is a romanticized idea of the past and it has no more relevance for today. Then there are some people who say that there's no homogeneous African identity, and those are often anthropologists. So they say, you know, there's so many specific different tribes and cultures within those tribes. We cannot say that there's a such a thing as an African person having an African outlook to life. I'm not going to go into all the counter arguments. I'm just giving you this as an information. There's also people who say we don't need um, Ubuntu because we already have human rights and all African countries have signed the human rights treaties. So away with Ubuntu is not relevant anymore. We have now human rights treaties. Then there's people who even feel attacked by Ubuntu because they say this is cultural relativism of human rights. And cultural relativism of human rights means you're going to undermine the basis of the human rights. And of course, there is always the fear then that there is going to be oppression of women, there's going to be genital mutilation, and all of that is then going to be ascribed to Ubuntu, which I think is a very unfair way of boxing Ubuntu in some narrow cultural box. Then there are also people who say Ubuntu uh, is denying punitive justice because the people who were perpetrators of apartheid uh, were not punished, but they were forgiven if they came up and told the truth about their crimes. Uh, and there are also sections within South African society of black South Africans who have actually uh, launched a court case against the Truth and Reconciliation Commission saying that um, uh, punitive justice should be passed and there was no real justice in uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Then there are, of course, people, and this, this is an uh, argument you hear very often, say, well, Africa is in such a mess and there are so many countries that have corruption, so it's Ubuntu is not being implemented, this is a nice, very ideological idea, but if they don't implement it themselves, then why should we in the West listen to those values? Then I always say, well, the Christians also had crusades, so maybe, you know, we did always live up to our human rights. 
Then there are people who say that Ubuntu, because it's communalist, it's also communist. And then are, at the, on the other hand, communists are against Ubuntu because they say it's anti-communist because they uh, want uh, Ubuntu to incorporate a, a power dynamic. Then finally, there are also people who are saying that the, the premises of sharing within Ubuntu is preventing op upward mo mobility. So in other words, you live in the township and you have a good job and you're sharing whatever you earn with your family and with your friends and therefore you have these, these stones tied to your body and you're never moving up and having a, life li a lifestyle because you're sharing all your wealth with others. It's of course the question is what is, what is your definition of success and what is your definition of your purpose in life. Um, I want to end uh, my lecture here. I don't know if I... I think I finished my time. But I am ending this uh, with uh, this picture of a demonstration in South Africa. Of course you know that in South Africa there's a lot to do about the current government. And therefore I don't want to claim that Ubuntu has given us all the solutions. But I do want to stress that Ubuntu gives us a different perspective on life. Which I think in the West we can also learn from and that if we have an exchange between the West and the East or the West and the South, that that should be a mutual exchange and it cannot only be an exchange of the West saying we have concluded human rights treaties, everybody has signed it, which is a very Western European way of thinking to want to legalize everything and that we should also take note of the valuable contributions of other cultures in philosophy. Thank you.